Hey, make sure you check out guitarmerch.com. We've got loads of cool guitar, music, and everyone loves guitar t-shirts, hoodies, and mugs, and everything comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to you. Head on over to guitarmerch.com. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And all the way from England, we have Scott Matthews. He's a super successful and very talented artist and songwriter. And uh, I, I recently got turned on to Scott, and I'm really glad I did. He's, I listened to his whole catalog. It's, it's really beautiful. Uh, give you a quick thumbnail sketch. He's a singer, songwriter, guitarist from England. He's an excellent sto songwriter and storyteller in his lyrics. His music is extremely moving. He's actually a really good slide player as well and a fingerstyle guitar player. Uh, so vo vocally, man, his voice is like as tender as Tom York's from Radiohead, but he has the tone of a Chris Cornell. So he's got a, a, a really wide range. It's a great voice. He's performed on a number of international sellout tours with artists such as Rufus Wainwright, Burt Janch, Robert Plant, and Allison Krauss. He's getting ready to go on tour with Rob opening up for Robert Plant. He's also uh, open for the Foo Fighters, Snow Patrol, and Tori Amos. Robert Plant and Danny Thompson have both made guest appearance on two guest appearances on two of Scott's albums. Danny is the former bassist from Richard for uh, Richard Thompson, John Martin, and Alexis Corners Blues, and Scott is already coming out of his shell, his, his reserved British shell. So this is going to be a good show. Scott, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming. Hey, on. thank you very much for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure. And hello, Likewise. everybody uh, who's tuning in. Likewise, we already got to meet your son, the whole family. This is good. Yeah. All right. How did you? Fr is it? Is it cold there? By the way, I meant to ask you that because you got a sweater. It's okay. On. It's yeah. It's it's yeah. It's uh. So we're kind of uh, March time. So it's yeah. It's it's a bit a bit chilly a bit when chilly. the sun goes. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. And the, the uh, my, my little studio gets pretty cold as well actually. Um. And I have all my acoustics in here, so it does have to kind of watch the temperature shift and. Uh, oh get, yeah. Can drop pretty pretty cold, yeah. All righty. Well, let's talk about how did you first get your career started, and what were some of those challenges early on to get things moving? Um. Well, kind of going all the way back, I started playing guitar when I was about eleven, and um, my parents bought me a an electric guitar. I, I, I had a guitar when I was seven, an acoustic, but the reality was I didn't really take to it. You know, I didn't didn't feel it was uh for me it was probably out of tune for about three years <laughs> and then uh something happened where i discovered it might have been eric clapton or something and then for my 11th birthday i had an electric guitar it was a marlin slammer I think what I is that it. it was like a strat copy okay uh cost me 30 pounds and my parents bought it for me but uh the 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 key thing was uh i also had for my birthday some Jimi hendrix albums uh -huh. so, uh, Hendrix smash hits, uh, Electric Ladyland, an original of my dad's, um, and that with, was with the women was, on the on the yeah the, yeah I have that one yeah, yeah. so um, that was pretty pretty life changing record you know just because completely understood what I wanted to do at that moment did you really and, yeah it was bizarre you know I, I didn't look back that from that moment and. I, I had about maybe 80 pounds worth of uh, birthday money as well. So I went to my, my local music shop, bought an overdrive pedal, wah-wah pedal, and um, a tremolo pedal. And All for 80 made. bucks? Yeah, man. So uh, we're talking wow. 1987. That's pretty cool. So it's it a decent amount of money just to learn pedals. But also as well, the guy at the music shop, um, Mick, I forget his surname, but Mick used to be in a band in, called the Californians in the mid 60s English band um, of course and uh, Mick actually played with Jimi Hendrix it's, it was in the local newspaper um, I didn't know this at the time but um, Jimi Hendrix played the, the Gourmand Theatre in Wolverhampton in 67 and the uh, the lineup was pretty extreme like Scott Ward, the Walker Brothers Engelbert Humperdinck um, there's another one as well Anyway, yeah, Jimi Hendrix was on there as well. And it was That's funny, a... Engelbert Humperdinck and Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, such a bizarre lineup. <laughs> I think Cat Stevens was there as well, actually. I'm not 100%. But, um, man, my parents were there as well. And, uh, and Mick, the Californian, supported Jimi Hendrix. And they had an after show um, uh, jam at a, at a place not too far from where I live. So, but yeah, 11 years old. And it was, you know, I learned Purple Haze 
That was the first thing I, I kind of grasped. But then you get the overdrive pedal on that as well. You know, that was it. That's amazing. Um, so I kind of worked all my way through my teenage years as a guitar player, you know, from the next step and the next step of, you know, being into people like Joe Satriani and and all those kind of L.A. hotshot guys, you know, Jason Becker and Joey Tafola and... Um, oh, so you were into, like, the Shredders? Yeah, Paul Gilbert and all, all the, all the uh, you know, the Whittlers, man. You know? Um, so that was that was my kind of trajectory in terms of a guitar player. And, you know, I got pretty, pretty advanced around the ages of 17 to 18. You know, I was really into my modes and scales and everything. Um, but then... You know, luck on luck didn't lose interest, but then it wasn't really getting me anywhere at the same time. Uh, then went to art college, uh, about uh, 16 or 16, 17, for about three years. What, did you, then, what were you trying to do there? Or what were you studying, um, there, I should say? Well, my, um, my dream was to be a, a comic book artist. That was wow. The, that was the, the vision, you know, to 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 be the next you know man I, you think about people like frank frazetta or simon bisley or somebody like that or um greg staples you know some fantastic artists out there uh that's what i wanted to do um but so that took over for a while and then i eventually came back to guitar when i was you know kind of early 20s um and then yeah just kind of got into it uh i was still probably not sure what i wanted to do you know probably more into uh, songwriters then when I revisited um, playing guitar and I'd suddenly discovered people like Susan Vega and Neil Finn of Crowded House you know so suddenly things just changed I was listening to songs a lot more for no reason just that my my interests had changed you know music and um, and then I yeah discovered Joni people like that that's pretty amazing that you went from Satri, you know, all these shreddy guys to singer songwriters. Mm, it is, isn't it? And I, I, I suppose as well, I kept thinking afterwards, well, did I actually get anything from that phase of, you know, being a teenager that was just wanting to kind of, you know, get the RPM kind of counter going? Yeah. But uh, maybe I did learn something. Maybe things were going in subconsciously, you know, the types of ways to phrase and. You know, how to construct chords and um, things were maybe working that I wasn't aware of. Um, and I probably put it to good use when, in terms of approaching the next phase of being a guitar player in my 20s when it comes to alternate tunings and um, experimenting more with, you know, those kind of bizarre accidents of chords and things you couldn't play in standard tuning. Um, so my interests suddenly accelerated from my mid twenties. Um, you know, hearing people like John Martin, um, yeah, Nick Drake, um, David Graham. You know, all the all the kind of folk purists, I guess. And then you hear Jimmy Page. One of my favourite Zeppelin albums was Zep Three, and uh, with all the acoustic two. stuff. Yeah, more acoustic, you know, and uh, Tangerine and Friends, those kind of songs. Measuring a summer's day, you know. Oh, da -da yeah, uh, I forgot to mention actually, Zeppelin was a, another influence of mine when I was. Uh, I, I think at the time, I, that's it. If I just backtrack, uh, when I was eleven, so I had my uh, my guitar and Hendrix records, but for that, uh, that uh, following Christmas, my brother had uh, Zeppelin four for Christmas. My brother was three years older than me, so. We got into Zeppelin at the same time when I was probably around about, you know, 12, 12 or 13 maybe. And, uh, man, that was it. Uh, I knew to thought after all these years, I'd get to tour with Robert. You'd be touring with Plant, I know. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. What, you mentioned Joe. I had Joe on the show here a couple of times. I got to tell you, he's one of the nicest, as a human being, he's just a very nice person. Joe, very Joe. Satriani. Oh, 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 cool, man. Yeah, he's a very sweet guy, really mellow, a little shy, yeah. but very, very sweet person. I saw Joe at the in the, the Extremist tour, which was probably 91, I think, 90 or 91. That's like, way In Birmingham, Birmingham NIA, or NAC. That was amazing. Yeah. Man, the Satchmeister on your show, fantastic. Yeah, I've had, he was great. 
What, okay, so what was your first break then that sort of helped you form who you were or who you are? Um, first break. I mean, I think I, I joined a band, a uh, local band, in the uh, two thousand and one. Uh, I was in a couple of bands before that, but you know, we didn't really, it didn't really amount to much, you know. Um, but then two thousand and one. Uh, a buddy of mine uh, asked me if I wanted to join his band. Positive Firefly, we were called. Positive Firefly. Yeah, or the uh, the Dutch version, which is a positive verflich. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we done we done okay, you know. For a couple of years, we uh, I was just playing guitar then, though, um, and uh, kind of singing a little bit, only a little bit, just you know, nervous backing vocals, that kind of thing. Um, cause I joined a theater the, the year before that, just trying to provide music for the, the theater productions. I was employed as a guitar player and my audition was like Steve Ray Vaughan, <laughs> pride, pride and joy, just kind of wailing on that. Um, so then, uh, kind of gradually got confidence, you know, with just playing in public and then doing a few backing vocals on a couple of shows. And then I think that naturally led me to. You know, we're talking like 2001, 2002. So that led me to wanting to be um, more interested in communicating through words, you know, rather than just a fretboard, you know, which, had, which had been all my life up until that point. So we're talking me at the age of, you know, 20, I can't even work it out now, um, 27, 28, that kind of time. Uh, finally, having a go at singing. Um, but it wasn't one of those overnight, whoa. I can sing. I still have a massive issue with just the idea of singing. Um, but um, it was, I got enough confidence through my, the band I was into to really uh, kind of get a sense of who I wanted to be and uh, what I could offer the world through music. Mm. What made, it's a, I give you a lot of credit because you went from being a guitar player and then playing in a band and then all of a sudden you're a solo artist. How did you make that jump? Um, well, the band finished in kind of 2003. Uh, our drummer left. Um, our drummer, Matt Thomas, he's, he's now the drummer in the, the Joy Formidable, a UK band, um, Welsh band. So, uh, yeah, we, we kind of just, in, you know, things just uh, fizzled away, you know, and, uh, for whatever reason. But um, 2003, I kind of had the confidence. I was writing my own songs then, um, and I was coming together with all kinds of ideas and 2003 was actually quite a big year on, on reflection you know I'd wrote Dream Song which was one of the first songs on the album uh, Passing Stranger and at the very end of 2003 I wrote Elusive which was uh, quite a departure to the from the original uh, from the version that we all know um, so it was just a it was just a sequence of events which you know when the band finished I just thought well okay there's no rules you know I can do this myself and just continue on that pathway to um, to making music and writing more songs and, of course, living your life as well and where you are at that point. Um, yeah, it was good energy, you know. There's a lot of energy there, 2003, 2004. Um, and on the summer, the spring of 2004, 2003, I met a guy at um, uh, my, actually my very first solo show. Uh, supporting my friend's band, The Other Smiths. The Other and, Smiths, uh, that's yeah. funny. And uh, so it was, a, it was a room full of, you know, Smiths fans, you know, 300 people, 350 people. And there's me playing Dream Song, you know, one of the kind of Eastern-influenced tracks of mine. And a guy came up to me and said, uh, this is this is a few a few uh, months later, I met him at a, in a local club and just said, oh, was you the guy opening for The Smiths? I was like, yeah, that was me, yeah. Ah, oh, cool, really enjoyed it. Um... Do you have any demos? And uh, uh, yeah, so I kind of got a demo together and, uh, and, and passed it on to uh, uh, Martin Davis, who was, ended up being my manager, and a guy called Marco Thomas, who set up a record label for me. Uh, so it was all pretty frantic, but I'd written the, 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 the nucleus of my, my debut album hmm. in about six months. But again, from, from no real experience of doing this before, so 2003, 2004, you know, talk about the energy of, and the the prolific nature of 
suddenly me with an acoustic and writing songs. It was like, what? There's a, a different kind of energy just coming from somewhere I didn't expect. Um, and and probably in the invention from myself as a guitar player as well, I was interested in suddenly what I was up to, you know, doing some pretty, in, I thought some pretty interesting melodic stuff. And Yeah, first um, album's great. There's a lot of variety in there, you know, and being, you know, I was into Ray Kudra, still into Ray Kudra and people like that. And so all these guitar influences that had um, just kind of come along all over the, the, you know, the previous 15 years or so actually focused me in such a way that was probably unique to myself. Um, and uh, yeah, it might, probably explains why the first record's pretty eclectic, almost like a guessing game record. You're not exactly sure what, what's going to happen from one song to the next. Uh, you know, I, I, I've listened to hundreds of first, I, I thought it was a, I, I didn't think it was as inconsistent as you, you might think it is. I, th I thought it was, everything was well laid out. It made a lot, it, it fit really well together. I mean, yeah, plus but, man, you got a lot of balls put, I mean, in a, I mean that in a good way. I had a question here, 19 songs on your first record, man. That's fucking awesome. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's one of those, I mean, Thank there's, you. there's, uh, there's certainly, um, there's there's kind of interludes. I was I wanted something pretty seamless, you know. That was the idea of the record. Something that just uh, there's no kind of dead spots in the record. No, you know? it's a really it's, good um, record. Yeah, cheers, man. It's um, still to this day I play a lot of the songs from the from that first record, and after all this time, they still resonate. You know, after all this time, man, it's such a weird thing. But I come to write set lists like for for tours I'm on. I'm like, okay, right, Passing Stranger, let's get that one in there. See, <laughs> yeah, let's go for those. So, um, I yeah, like the then, Wasp in the Jar, and I like the white, Wasp in the Jar, yeah, yeah, White Feathered Medicine, Earth to Calm, yeah, City City Headache, you know, Prayers. I mean, there are a lot of great songs on there, I thought. Cheers, man. It's yeah. uh, so yeah, it's uh, you know, we, we're talking uh, 2005, I got to the, offered a, a record deal, you know. I didn't have any prior experience and not sure what to expect but um the two guys uh, that were involved with the project were um really passionate about the songs and uh and my music so uh yeah it's a bit of a leap of faith you know we recorded my debut album in oh, for about maybe on and off six to nine months in 2005 and then uh we officially released it in 2006. that's um, so cool and yeah we got instant radio play you know it was like Suddenly, I'm on national radio, Radio One. Was it weird? Um, Zane Lowe was uh, all over it, man. It was great. It was. It was. Pr I was in. A, I was in a pub actually, and um, uh, at a lunchtime, and uh, I'm going back maybe kind of late spring, summer of 2006, I think. And uh, I had a message from a friend saying, "Oh man, congratulations! I've just heard your song Elusive on Joe Wiley on news like Radio One, big kind of prime time moment." I was like, shit, man. I felt just the dread. It, I, you know, maybe other people would have had a reaction of like, yes, fucking get in. You know, but I was completely the opposite. What, you thought you were afraid crumbled. of being judged? I was just crumbled, man. I was like, man, this is it. Hit the big time. Yeah. You know, national radio. And maybe you just kind of, the, the panic. You know, I didn't want to kind of any, any fame or anything like that. That's the last thing I wanted. But, um... You know, I was just kind of riding with the waves of that moment, and it was actually turned out to be a, a great time looking back, you know. It was only in the moment I couldn't see him because it was just absolute panic. You know, I've never been down to London that many times before. <laughs> so for me, it was like, man, this is just, uh, this is too much all of a sudden. Yeah. You know, from a, a humble kid from where I'm from, you know, from the West Midlands and, you know, the heart of the black country and the, and the Industrial Revolution, you know, we're very... Uh, humble folk where I'm from hmm. you know and uh, so to be thrust into that limelight on national radio you know and people were like straight away well, I didn't expect them to talk like this you know uh, you know and I've got quite an Ozzy Osbourne kind of accent but it's it's, it's similar you know uh, Jalen come on look at the fucking dogs and shit all over the carpet <laughs> you know so it's um, that was like that kind of made me super paranoid overnight Oh, because right. you were like sort of in the spotlight now, and yeah, the, the, and the, the people was picking up on the accent thing as well. But you know, this, this is from my perspective. Where yeah, I think we all tend to be our harshest critics, though. Yeah, you know, it's. I mean, yeah, 
your accent's fine. I I I love accents, so though, because I grew up in New York, though, and I understand them all. Yeah. yeah see, so it's I, um, I think you see even people in in the in England, some some regions struggle to understand my accent as well. Really? Yeah. So you don't see we don't talk talk like this, you know. It's like oh, fucking hell, Godfrey is a great shot there. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, the West Midlands is a different animal, you know. It's uh, Robert Plant's got that kind of slightly different uh, feel to his accent, I suppose, being well travelled and a bit more transatlantic going on, you know. But um, yeah, it's uh, but it was always all crazy. Two thousand six was a very bizarre year, you know. And from that point, um, there's a lot of interest, you know. My, my one of my uh, big shows in London was at the a place that's no longer there called the 12 bar on uh tin pan alley denmark street and um, that's where all the guitar stores are on denmark street that's right yeah, yeah. and so th this venue is very renowned for a warm-up venue you know neil young had played there i think uh, from uh, correct me if I'm, if I'm right on this one actually um maybe some listeners will have a more of an idea but i'm sure the 12 bar was like a, a warm-up uh venue right dylan played there as well and uh so i got the chance to play there as well and it was you know daunting we had all the industry people there and you know the summer was crazy crazy time and i ended up doing a deal a deal with island records oh, that's and, a uh, massive label yeah yeah I, I was swayed by the heritage and the history of mm. island record they had the chris blackwell era you know bob marley u2 nick drake was on there of course i mean pj harvey um so yeah it was um it was uh, a strange time. I was kind of really thrust into it, you know, and I, and I didn't really feel comfortable with that whole phase. I think it was good. It was really beneficial for me, though. You know, I think if I had my time again, I'd probably do it again, you know. But what would you have done different if you had to do that again? Like, what were some um, of the... What, did you make any mistakes that, you know, in hind, of course, hindsight being twenty twenty. Yeah, I think uh, just have a bit more faith in my own judgment, you know, could, uh, maybe trust myself in decisions you know and don't be afraid to to say something um but it really was it did really feel like rabbit in the headlights you know for two years two three yeah. years um you, you know it was a great time because we got you know pretty early on you know from releasing my my debut album in kind of some context here within two three months of releasing that album 2006 we got a call from a, my brand new booking agent Hey Scott, got you some gigs with the the Foo Fighters. You fancy that, mate? <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Did you say Foo Fighters? Twist yeah, my arm. Yeah. Yeah. Snow Patrol was another one in that summer as well. That time. So it was it was fantastic to have those experiences and to be really seeing a different level of operation. You know, if you can really make something of your music, this is what you can achieve. You know. So it was a highly beneficial time, and I'd probably yeah, just probably. You know, time again, just have a little bit more faith in myself and the the vision mm. um, for things, and uh, and just learn to yeah, kind of listen to your heart a bit more. Um, but you know, certainly certainly from a musical perspective, every record that I've put out to this day is something that's I've never been swayed by anyone. You know, I haven't been told what to do. You know, it's been very much true to myself and I can look back on all those records which is what seven so far mm -hmm. and just think well yeah that's where I was in that point okay I was there and I'm, I can just keep my head held high and just say well I was true to myself in that artistic sense so that was you know ticked all the boxes there um, maybe you, you can hear that for whatever that's worth you can hear that in each one there there it's it's pretty genuine man yeah I, I, every single one of them yeah, I, I think so. Um, you know, and, and also as well, you probably learn from, you know, maybe there's some songs that shouldn't have been on records, you know, early, in the early days. But um, but I'm, I think I'm a, I'm a better judge of my own material now. And maybe, you know, I'm a better editor of of, um, of my work. Mm -hmm. uh, but still kind of keen to capture the spontaneity as well. Um, but certainly... You know, those touring experiences in the early days really put me on a good pathway to understanding, you know, to see what Rufus Wainwright perform in front of 2,000 people every night, you know, and to see Robert and Alison Krauss, you know, one of my first big gigs 
was with those guys and T-Bone Burnett, you know, in 2008. You know, Robert heard my first record and, and phoned me up, which was pretty mind-blowing. That's serious. So what, how did that phone call go? Um, it was through my second album. Um, I was working with a producer friend of mine locally called Gavin Monaghan. And uh, Gavin had uh, got to know Robert through uh, kind of, because Robert, you know, goes to local venues and, you know, always, always looks, you know, goes with his, he's at the time going with his lad, Jesse Lee. And, uh, you know. He's from, the, he's from your area? That's right, yeah. 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 Um, so uh, Gavin phoned me up and said, uh, Robert, in Gavin's voice, yeah, Robert's, uh, he's heard your record. Yeah, he really loves it, mate. Yeah. Uh, he wants your number. <laughs> Why, <"Wait>, man? <laughs> really? Uh, so Gavin, uh, yeah, swapped numbers and uh, Gavin sent me a message. I was in a festival in uh, Ireland and uh, Gavin said, Robert's going to phone you in 10 minutes, so you're free. Oh, man, shit. Yeah, okay. So Robert phones me up and just uh, congratulates me on the first album and really enthused by the sound that I make, you know. And um, so I was gobsmacked, you know, just from that moment. And uh, got to meet him finally a few months later. Um, and Gavin was uh, was recording my album and, and Gavin uh, was keen for me to finish a song called 12 Harps. And I'd only had like a verse, a verse and, a, and a, maybe a, a, a guitar phrase or melody Gavin was like you know what Scotty boy I think we should get Robert to sing on this what do you reckon and I was like hmm um you think two guys singing on track has he, has he, ever, has he ever worked um so we did man. we made the phone call and uh I sent Robert the song and he was really up for singing on it that's so cool like, whoa serious so we got Robert in the studio not long after actually to arrange the session and uh so i mean robert there i'm playing the guitar to him and then we just start singing through a few, a few ideas and harmony parts it was all very quick you know suddenly there's a professional in the room you know and, uh, <laughs> suddenly there's a professional in the room i like that <laughs> yeah and um so it was a very surreal experience and uh yeah the 12 hops was uh was born you know and robert's vocals were great on it great um, so it was a, you know, again, these are experiences that I had very early on, you know, it was barely two years into me making records. That was your second record. Second record elsewhere. Yeah. yeah called elsewhere. And, uh, that was still with Island records. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a, I was, I was still pretty much trying to, trying to find my feet in that time as well, you know, um, and understanding who I was. You know, because I'd made that first record, you know, I'd spent my whole life kind of getting to that point. But then it was like, oh, Christ, I've only got 12 months to record the second one. Okay. For the yeah, it's window. funny how that works, right? You got 20, yeah. 22 years for the first one. And, That's uh, it, yeah. So I had like, you know, windows, hardly any time to, to write the second album because I was touring a lot. Um, So... Yeah, I was. I was. I think, in truth, probably struggled with the whole pattern of how this was the cycles of how this was supposed to work. You know, you make the record, you have a bit of downtime to make your music. You spend, God knows, how long in a studio, and um, and then you you release the the, the the music to the masses. You know, um, so it was, it was a it was a it was an influential time in many respects. But yeah, maybe the only thing I'd probably change is. Just being a better judge of the of the music, you know, not being a, maybe a, a better editor of the songs, which is impossible because that only comes from experience. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. So I wanted to ask you about um, you, you. You're like a very laid back guy. Like you're mm. a, like you're what can you know what Americans would think. Oh, these are conventional British guy. You know, you're soft spoken. You're not like a raving lunatic. But your work ethic is obviously really, really good. Where did you get that from? Because you put out 19 songs, man. That's on a first record. That's a lot of work. Yeah, I think, like I said, I think when I go back to 2003 and 2004, that was uh, the energy of that time was I couldn't kind of keep up with myself. Yeah. You know, because there was a lot of things happening and I was maybe I could 
from a guitarist perspective, I was into suddenly a different way of playing. And the just the sheer enjoyment from from this that dis- element of discovery was uh, was just making me write more and more songs, you know. And uh, so that was, yeah. I, I look back and take you know I can listen back to tapes from that moment mm-hmm. and just really hear stuff I and I hadn't used or it was like a, a section of a new idea or, or riff that um, really, you know. Um, had some had something in it, you know, and I, and I, I didn't p- pursue it, but I certainly I still have the tapes, you know, the shoebox full of tapes, and I will re- revisit some stuff at some point. Yeah, but it's a bit of a whirlwind on that time. But all your even subsequent to that, your lyrics are very thorough. You, you know, you, you you read your lyrics, you, you know, you you put a lot of work into that it's it's a misnomer people often think uh when things are easy to you know when they're smooth they think oh he just cranks them out it's the actual opposite because they get smooth because of all the work you're putting into it yeah it's uh i suppose lyrically it's uh, it's um still can never kind of put my finger on on things you know where they come from um you know didn't, I, was, I wasn't a massive reader, you know. One of those things I was guitar, 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 guitar. But then, through singing and suddenly feeling I can express myself this way, um, it naturally led me to the songwriting world, you know. And you discover Joni Mitchell for the first time, and that's like Paul Simon, who's one of my heroes. Ah, uh, he's the, one of the most talented songwriters ever. It, yeah, I, I think if uh, if I had to really kind of pin it down to one, I'd have to say Paul's right up there, top of the tree for me. Yeah, he's phenomenal. Um, and then I, you know, I worked down to the 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 equally talented Susan Vegas of this world, and you know, yeah, Crowded House mentioned before. Um, and then um, and then just through that, you know, you you start to read up on what they were into and what inspired those, and uh, so then of course get into more poetry. You know, Dylan Thomas. Uh, Robert Frost, Bukowski, and all that kind of stuff. So that, that, that kind of naturally led me more into reading and, um, you know, kind of a lot of the British kind of stuff as well, like the, um, yeah, the, the, the British kind of kitchen sink dramas as well. Saturday mm-hmm. night, Sunday morning, you know, Taste of Honey, you know, the writer Alan Salito, um, you know, real British stuff, you know. And uh, that was all, all going in. And making me understand my own, uh, being a big fan of the Smiths as well, uh, and trying to grasp where Morrissey was coming from with his early songwriting. Uh, so you discover what he was into, and yeah, this, uh, this natural kind of rabbit hole. Yeah. You just think, wow, how did I get to this point suddenly? Same with guitar playing, it's the same. And then suddenly, oh, I've got three albums worth of songs, what's going on there? Right. You know, but um, it was certainly a marriage of what I was also into musically as well. Um, you know, from, from with each record, there's certainly different head spaces that I that I was in. Um, I want so, yeah. I want to talk about some of that about your head spaces. Let's just uh, I want to talk about a few of the songs I, I really enjoyed. Passing strangers from from the Passing Strangers record. Man, I I was sitting here at this desk. I was doing my taxes that day, mm. which is like I don't think Hardcore. it's any any better in England it's a fucking misery it's not like you know like it's just horrible you, you know whether you have to put any money in or not it's just like extremely unfulfilling it's like you know list of things that you have to do that's always going to be on the bottom right so I was kind of miserable I didn't slept well and all of a sudden that song came on it was like 5 30 in the afternoon I remember it and it totally changed my whole disposition it was like it really made me feel so good and I was curious right. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it's a it's a really great song. What what's the backstory to that song? Ah, a good question. Um, I think, like a lot of the songs, I get the if there's a good chorus line going on. You know, I think I had something like um, so some baritone, so I had to figure the tune in. So I was going there. I think I'd like See the sign up ahead It calls out your name The beautiful sign But it makes no sense On key 
See the sign up ahead, it calls you sign up ahead, it calls out your name, it's a meaningful sign, but it makes no sense. So having a lyric like that, and one of the very first lyrics I had to the song was the chorus. So I'm going. Coffee upon me is cold, the paper I'm reading is old, and that smile is not your own. Clothes that I wear is soaked through. I bought out a look for you. And there's a million things I can't do. So it's, it was all, you know, it was all kind of steering me towards like a road song. Great. You know, Dude, thank you so much. That was so cool. There was, a, there, was a, there was an openness to my lyrics as well. That I, that, um, um, there's an English, uh, famous English songwriter called Judy Zook. And she was actually responsible for being on the Ivan Abello's panel for one of okay. my award. Yeah, yeah, right. Judy said to me, uh, she said, it sounds like you wrote Elusive when you were without thinking about it. I was like, yeah, probably, you know? And she said, don't ever lose that quality. Oh, you know? okay. And, and that's how that first record feels still, you know? It just felt, uh, there, was, there was like a, there was a freedom in the words, you know? The coffee you poured me is cold. The paper I'm reading is, in, is reading is old, and that smile is not your own. I just thought this, you know, this really pissed off waitress, you know, just completely false, you know, and uh, and th that painted a whole picture for the song. Um, and uh, yeah, that was 2004, and I, and I remember completing that. It's actually one of the longest songs I've ever written. There's like nine verses, and uh, but it was such a there was such a freedom to the and a looseness and a and a, an immediacy to the words that. I've, I've always tried to retain that quality, the songs, you know, kind of a snapshot of a moment or a lyric that just feels really good. You know, the instinctive nature of, of words, you know, I love that, that moment when you get the marriage of words and music that's created just exclusively to you and, and that's what you've made. You know, it's such a powerful feeling. It's like when somebody looks at a, a, a Robert Frost poem or something and it feels so complete, you might, you go, Christ, how did you get to that point, you know? <laughs> Such a fantastic thing to be able to to achieve, you know. With the, obviously, the the the, the uh, language is is absolutely gigantic. Fantastic. Yeah, words are so important. Exactly. Yeah, but then you can read some like haiku poetry, and it's so minimalist, and you think it's so succinct. You know, how do you get it to that point? You're hardly saying anything, but it's so powerful. Well, well you and mentioned Bukowski. Songs. That's why I love him so much. He's such an economical writer. He's so yeah. guttural, and he don't have to use a lot of words. Exactly, yeah. And, yeah. and it reminded me, when you said, I don't want to lose that quality, he, he had this thing, you ever, I don't know if you ever heard it, don't try. He, he, his whole, somebody once asked him, you know, how did you write like that? And he goes, don't try. He goes, you don't try to write like that. You just, you just do it. And that's the thing when you said, well, I, I want to make sure I don't, lose that elusive you can't try to lose you can't try not to lose that elusive you're either gonna yeah. have it or you're not that's it and then, then then the danger the flip side to that is as well if you start to overthink you know, yeah it's like oh man i'm losing the essence of just you know that that kind of raw magic that that was probably initially there in the music but then because i maybe wrung the whole thing out you know it's like well i don't exactly know where i'm going anymore with this yeah i overthought it um, so yeah, that's certainly, I, I, I saw Judy uh, back in a show in, uh, on my last tour in October and I told that to Judy. I said, you told me, you know, about, um, not losing that quality where, you know, it sounds like I didn't think about it. Thanks for that. You know, yeah, that's a, that's my mantra. You know, when I come to a blank piece of paper, you know, my wife's the same as well. She just like saying, just don't think about it. I can already see that you're just stopping, not writing anything. Just practice the mechanics of just purely writing something. It doesn't matter yeah. what it is. And I, I don't do it enough, you know. Um, but it's only now that I'm getting back into um, trying to write some new material, that I'm um, trying to grasp that concept again of just freedom. It's yeah. it's hard. It's interesting. I, I My guitar teacher is actually a British guy. He's here in the States. and And I'm at the point where I'm, starting to solo within 
I've only been playing five years, and I and I'm and I'm have an excellent, really good ear. I played saxophone as a kid. I mean, I have a great ear. I could play anything I hear, but I don't know the theory. And and so he was, you know, I'm learning now how to do solo within chord changes. And I said, man, I, I feel paralyzed. He goes, you're overthinking this. He goes, trust me, Gary Moore, and Eric Clapton were not thinking about this shit <laughs> when they're on stage. And there's a so much. You know what you're saying is so you learn by doing, not by thinking. That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's sure. um, so yeah. That 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 kind of mantra has been taking me far. You know, and uh, yeah, I still feel like um, I'm always excited to know what the next wave of songs will bring. You know, because musically, more of a, I've got more of a sense of what I'm into, and you know, nothing will ever be massively drastic. You know, I won't suddenly depart into a drum and bass kind of movement you know right no rockabilly so, songs who knows who knows <laughs> but uh certainly i know what i'm into and i know where uh i've certainly got more of a sense of my strengths and you know there's the, the weaknesses that have always always been there you just kind of push them back even further yeah you know you constantly you think about the pitch of your voice for instance or a certain register in your voice that doesn't really work very well you know so you're trying to write think about your keys a lot more um, I was doing a show um, in Clonakilty, which was in Southern Ireland, many years ago, and uh, Roy Harper was sitting right in front. I knew he was straight away, and I was like, "Shit, it's Roy Harper!" So he didn't say anything before the gig, you know. He just thought, kind of arms folded, just like, "Right." <laughs> in. Yeah, and um, so uh, I played my set. You know, it was a guitar festival, and uh, I must have done something right because he came up to me afterwards and. Shook my hand first off. That was great. Really enjoyed it, mate. Brilliant. Yeah, loved it. Great songs. I was like, whoa, that's off to Harper, man. Fair play. Yeah. So, uh, and then he said, uh, he's like, yeah, piece of advice. He said, uh, make sure you can write songs that you can sing when you're in your 60s. You know? So it got me thinking about you know, the register and the, and, the, and the range. You know? Like, obviously, playing Passing Strange on a baritone, I can see myself in my 60s having to play that song <laughs> on this baritone. <laughs> <laughs> my voice can only go so high you know but um so yeah i understand that and also some songs don't have a magic in a, in a, in a certain certain key you yeah you really find that sweet spot haven't you it's uh yeah i'm excited by just the process always excited by the process and you can tell me man your energy people. is like pretty high talking about this which is yeah. really nice to see you're talking about something you recorded 18 years ago yeah it's, that's pretty uh, cool yeah um, I like the the idea of you know mood mood piece records as well, you know where it could be that every song could just purely be haiku poetry. I think that's the pronunciation haiku. I think so, yeah. So like four lines to a song, you know, and just but the music's kind of ambient and cinematic, and you have just these words just dotted around the music. Um, I'm thinking kind of David Sylvian, you know, the more ambient. You know stuff now. You know, my very yeah minimalist approach. Um, but I also like my road songs, the country songs as well, and uh, story songs certainly. Dude, your voice is so good. Don't limit it to like four words in the song, <laughs> <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to. Uh, but certainly, I'm understanding more of where I can go, and uh, you know. And having those experiences of touring really understood. When when you watch somebody like Rufus Wainwright as well, that's like, man, he's just got this way about projecting his voice to an audience, you know, almost like in an operatic sense, you know, you just have to really understand the diaphragm and all that business, you know, where I'm still trying to work off this kind of one pack, you know. <laughs> too, too much beer. You're doing fine. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's, been, it's, it's, it's a great road. You know uh, that I've been on. I do, I do feel very grateful every every step of the way. Yeah. Second record. I'm gonna ask you about Fractured. That was on Elsewhere. Mm. Um, lyrics. You better be quick because I'm losing grip. So that mm. what was that about, man? If uh, you if you remember so I, even. Yeah. Well, I think in a sense of um, the music for a start. I was very keen to uh, move away from Passing Stranger because, you know, it was very all, all acoustic. I was probably steered to play a little, little bit too much acoustic on that first album. 
And I always love listening back to my, my only criticism of that first record is that man, I should have listened to myself because Earth to Calm clearly needed an electric guitar, okay. or you know, uh, some songs needed a, the real nice twang or the sh the sharpness of a Telecaster, which I didn't play on the record. I'm like, why don't I do that? So the second album, right? Okay, Fractured. This is clearly a song that's doffing the cap to Smashing Pumpkins. Just do that then, you know. I never put, I never stacked four guitar parts of the same part ever before, you know. It was just like this really thick, grungy fuzz. It's a great track. So heavy. I remember writing you thinking, this is man, this is a pretty potent stuff. Very different to my first record. But it was very deliberate as well. Um, and I'm, again, just trying to think back to the lyrics of it now, but certainly had um, probably they started off with the chorus lyric. You know, I am struggling, I can hold on. Where's your fight? Can you show me? I don't want to go now. Go. Yeah, and it went all kind of big and heavy. But lyrically, certainly, yeah, I suppose it was a, more of a dark record, actually. A little bit. Generally. But it's good. It's a great um, record, man. I, I'm I'm proud of that one, yeah. Um, the the video. Think, uh, yeah, the video's a bizarre, bizarre one. It's bizarre awesome. Location. Where where was that? Because I, I had a note here. It looks like out west in the U.S. Well, we tried we tried to get Arizona, but uh, the budget didn't kind of uh, to go that way. That's what it looked like. Far. So we 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 opted for. Uh, I'm going to kill all all illusions now for everyone. Uh, we actually was in the Cotswolds in England, darling. Yeah, oh, so, okay. Uh, we, uh, which is, I don't think was too far from where I lived actually, but, uh, and the weather was pretty shit as well. It wasn't great. You know, we yeah, it was overcast. Of, yeah. So we had to do some trickery there. The guys that were involved, um, they used a real stunt man as well. And they got me dressed up as this, uh, kind of deputy sheriff there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, just looking on the, on the planes and, uh, it was pretty, pretty, pretty cool video, but I really cool, really, man. It looked like a lot of fun to make, actually, too. Yeah, it was good. It was um, it was a good experience that one. Some all, all, of all the videos that I've I've had to kind of partake in. I mean, that was one I could tolerate. <laughs> it was really, really cool. It was like, oh man, okay, yeah, this. Uh... I hope you're saying that about this interview in a couple of hours or a couple of days. <laughs> of all the interviews I had to do, that this is one I could tolerate. <laughs> uh, this, this, is good. this is good, man. This is this is nice and natural. This is the way it should be. Um, but well, yeah, I can, I can look back on that that video pretty fondly. Think. Yeah, it was Not it was bad. really cool. Cool. It was really cool. I enjoyed it. And it was nice seeing it. It was a nice surprise seeing it because I listened on Apple and all of a sudden the video popped. I'm like, wow, this is cool because you usually don't see that. Oh, it was, brilliant. It was, okay. Yeah, it was great. All right. And then you released two albums, one in 2014, one in 2017. The first one was called Home Part One. The second was Home Part Two. Both great records. And in fact, many of those songs are in my uh my newly formed scott matthews playlist nice. so uh when you you obviously called it home part one so you had a plan it wasn't like oh let me call it home part one and then i may as well call the next one home part two you had to have some yeah what was the it was a plan there's a missing third album what, what the night delivers oh. so after elsewhere we um i um my deal with Island Records all kind of finished at that point. Okay. So we're, we're hitting kind of 20, 2009. So Elsewhere was released in 2009. And um, yeah, we kind of uh, departed and kind of cut our ties with, with Island Records. And um, I went back to um, just releasing kind of in the way I, I kind of knew independently uh, and put out a third record in, uh, we recorded it in 2010. Uh, we got Danny Thompson involved. Uh, for those that don't know, he's the he was John Martin's kind of right hand man for thirty odd years, um, and yeah, Danny's and played on uh, Nick Drake's Five Leaves Left album, and a little bit on Brighter Later as well. And I got to tour Danny with Danny, and uh, so again another set of experiences came. Um, and it was actually quite a looking back on that that time twenty twenty ten. Excuse me, um, 2011. Um, I got to I got to tour um, uh, with the Nick Drake tribute concert, and I was invited by the producer, the original producer Joe Boyd, 
and uh, met some fantastic human beings. It was a great experience, and and I think really galvanised everything about me getting to that point in 2011. Thinking, man, okay, I feel like I'm on the pathway now. This is this is a lot more understanding about myself. You know, the experiences of arms one and two. Um, artistically, I really grasped the 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 positive. Uh, moments of those two records and I think it probably explains why my third album What Night Delivers is for me probably the most kind of cohesive uh, um, record that I can understand where I was and uh, it feels really complete as a record you mean in the sense that it was deliberate and it wasn't like hey I need to put a record I got these songs you had a yeah because it was more in, purposeful exactly and being, being in studios up to that point as well, I got to work with John Lecky from uh, for the the deluxe version of Passing Stranger at Olympia. You know, it was like Olympic Studio, yeah. sorry. And um, so that was all these experiences of me understanding how producers and engineers work in studios. I was starting to get more thoughts about okay, this guy prefers this kind of sound to this one, you know. And um, so I was understanding all this stuff, when, and it explains why I went back to uh, the producer John Cotton for my third album. Because John produced my first album, and I knew, you know, working with John, John's strengths and how he would benefit the songs. So it was all very calculated. Yeah, that's me. great. You know, I was going in as an artist more confident in myself and understanding the set of songs that worked. And um, it felt really natural, natural process. And me and me and John, we finished a, a song called uh, "Ballerina Lake." Um, I've just realized I say erm quite a lot, don't I? I, I'm, no, I don't pay, I don't, I have, I don't judge anything because if I do, I, I've had to stop judging myself. So I'm yeah, a lot true. nicer to others. So I don't notice anything. Oh, <laughs> to be I, honest, I, I always do you sound that. great. I haven't thought anything like, oh, okay. this fucking That's guy does, keeps saying um. I mean, no, I'm just enjoying <laughs> our conversation. I'm just hoping cool, to God cool. I'm not saying um. <laughs> no, it's all good, man. It's all good. So, uh, yeah, so um, working with John, you know, we'd finished Ballerina Lake the first week of the, of the sessions. And I just knew, you know, my decisions that I thought in my head, you know, after all these years of, you know, we're talking me being in the industry, you know, for like, three or four years so i really got a sense of john and i just knew you know before we recorded anything i knew that john was the man to re to record these songs and uh it was just kind of one after the other like every song was just working i was like oh man you know my wife done the photography as well and we got the, oh, that's the cool we got the feel for the record visually as well which was quite a trick a challenge to do usually um so I can look back on the record and like really sense that I can look back on an artist and just think, well, he kind of knew where he was there. Yeah. You know, he felt comfortable with that. Um, and which probably explains why home part one and two came about, you know, that was a, that was two records that, you know, maybe we're looking at a, a different time as well. You know, we, it, first out, third album was released in 2011. So, um, and yeah, I'd had many great experiences at that point. You know, I'd been to Australia and toured uh, with the Nick Drake songs. You're and, like uh, a per I, ha I hate to say this, you're like a perfect guy to do that gig because you're your own artist and your own thing. But man, if there's anybody that the first thing you when you hear you say, "Holy shit, this is kind of like how Nick Drake." I mean, you're not you don't sound like Nick Drake. But it's that style, and there's not many people that do it. And you're you have such control over your voice. You know, okay. you don't you don't hit any wrong notes with your voice. And as vulnerable as you your records are, where it's just a guitar and you on often a lot of them, that says a lot, man. Cool. Well, I think um, yeah, Nick is. Uh... Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a, it's a, t a sad tale, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I just think of Nick and a you know uh, such a unique musician and singer. You know, one of those. I think you. Uh, when I think of singers, I'd put Nick right up there. You know, certainly in, it's it's weird because it, in the traditional sense, it was all pretty much you know, not kind of monotone, but 
there's certainly just a delivery, a kind mm -hmm. of hushed presence to it, which which really captivated him for, for me. And um, but then obviously you're drawn to his guitar playing as well. But um, so to be to be asked to play, you know, a, a, a tribute concert, I played two songs and uh, with a bunch of artists like Robin Hitchcock and people like that, and Crystal Warren and uh, Vashti Bunyan, uh, Teddy Thompson. So it was like a real great thing to do and to understand how I could put a, my own spin on Nick's songs, you know, because I'd, 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 I'd kind of gone from an electric guitar player to an acoustic player listening to Nick and John Martin and Davy Graham and Bert Jansch. So it's funny, the you can hear Nick Drake and you go, man, yeah, great, great stuff. And then you hear Bert Jansch and you go, okay, I can hear where Nick got his style from, you know, and then you hear Bert Jansch, and then you hear Big Bill Brunzi, and you go, oh, okay, that's where Bert got his style from. <laughs> so it it goes backwards all this time, and then of course, you know, you hear the all these different people, and it's you just try and you know, like we're all we're all kids in that respect, you know, we'll listen to a piece of music or, you know, we all want to be Eddie Van Halen. You know, after hearing that solo, eruption. And yeah, so yeah. we're all kind of like, we're all still doing that now. You know, well, I'll listen to Miles Davis or you know Joanna Newsom or something. And go, oh, man, I want, a, I want a little bit of that somewhere. How can I incorporate that feel, that idea, and you know, make it my own? Uh, Paul Simon was great at that. I mean, you know, took a lot of Jackson C. Frank stuff, and you know. Um, and Martin Carthy. He learns a lot of his licks from Martin Carthy. I so don't know all, these guys, so I'm writing that down. So we all kind of doff the cap to a degree, but essentially trying to give it your own thing because that's that's what it's all about. You know, Oscar Wilde was absolutely right. Be yourself because everybody else is already taken. Hmm. So that's always been the mantra. And uh, so, yeah, you know, that um, Home Parks 1 and 2, I'd had the experience of three albums and uh, budgets were a lot tighter as well. You know, going back to an independent route and um, I made records for nothing pretty much, you know. Uh, <laughs> I've got my own little studio here and I recorded Home Part 1 exclusively in this room. We had a drum kit in the corner. We had a, a accordion guy, a cello, uh, trumpets, flutes. Um, and it Are was, these all uh, local people from Wolverhampton? Uh, Friends that I'd, I'd got to know of and meet over the years and mm. that I played on my previous records. And uh, we, yeah, I got the, suddenly my contacts list of great players was like blossoming. Yeah, it's always. Through the Nick, through the Nick Drake's uh, yeah. tours as well. So I could suddenly find an accordion player and go, fancy having a go on this song? <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, I'll be down there later on, Scott. Yeah, brilliant. So uh, I think in, in terms of uh, uh, kind of being kind of a, a, a proud moment it was actually completing a record exclusively on my own recording and engineering everything not in a Are you engineered those records yeah the, the the home part one we had some help with the home part two uh, and then a buddy of mine Aidan Laverty he mixed homes what home part one and two hmm. so but it was a good feeling to actually start to track the instruments because I understood the difference between you know microphone patterns and the difference between a tube bike and a ribbon you know, and old reporter microphones like electro voice and all that kind of stuff. Bullet microphones, which you're just supposed to use for harmonicas. But I'm like, oh, I'll try singing in one of these then. And I was really into all kinds of stuff then from how that re microphone responded to a preamp and how that preamp and microphone responded to a guitar. Because the combinations and different colors that you suddenly could were at your disposal was, man, I was like a kid in the sweet shop in a candy <laughs> store, you know. I felt suddenly, like my, my knowledge was 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 getting, was increasing pretty rapidly. Um, yeah. And Holmes Part One and Two, that was an, a necessity. You know, I felt the need to, to, to do that for myself. Um, so, so you recorded those both, Scott, and then you so, released them separately, or did you record them? So, so? Um, so they were released uh, two years apart, three years apart, I think it was, two years. Um, so home part one was um, was recorded uh, for my uh, previous record label, 
And then, uh, yeah, we um, put in the second album, Home Part 2, was certainly the more colourful of the records of the two. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely was. And the instrumentation, we had to fit so much in there. It's pretty frightening at one point, trying to combat a sousaphone and a double bass. A <laughs> sousaphone. Yeah, in that lower register was a, was a nightmare. Um, like, like almost every song in there, it, I loved. I mean, real like every almost every track on that was oh, just phenomenal. That home part two is a great record. Yeah, thanks, man. It's uh, felt really that, that felt pretty satisfying. We we spent like three year, uh, three days, sorry, in a in a in a London studio. You know, kind of cheap as chips kind of studio, mm -hmm. um, just to essentially try and track the record live. Uh, that was the idea. So we'd have uh, me doing like a scratch kind of vocal and guitar. Uh, my drummer Sam, Sam Martin, was uh, on the kit in another kind of station in the in the big room. It was, it was a, like a mini Abbey Road, had that kind of feel to it. You had the control room upstairs, going down some stair uh, stairs to the, the main live space. We had my uh, buddy John Thorne on double bass in another room, isolation booth. And then my uh, piano player, cellist Danny Kane, was on a Steinway in the middle of the room. And we were cool. looking at each other going, wow, this is fantastic. Yeah, that's really cool. So essentially we got we got the bulk of the, the takes and all the material recorded at that studio for three days. But um, I still ended up doing like, you know, 50 odd percent, 60 percent back at home, you know, tracking the vocals. Um, yeah, with a lovely Palooza mic, actually, it's great. And all the guitars again. And, and then I get extra sessions back in this in my little uh, shedio shared studio um so i learned so much from that record uh of uh, from an engineering perspective you know the combinations of and how frequencies can battle with each other uh it was it was a bit of a dilemma at, at certain points i mean there's a track called waltz at nightfall which you know for those that know it it's uh it's, it's a long pretty, song it's pretty full on. I mean, it gets to the point where this big crescendo is just, it's just too much. <laughs> it's like, I just didn't feel, uh, my, my buddy Aiden, I said, good luck mixing that one because, uh, <laughs> yeah, it could end up being a catastrophe, but it, it came, came up Trump. It's, and, it's uh, a great record, man. I like home part two of all. Yeah. I, I just had a question. This is maybe a goofy question on the album cover of new skin. It's a weird, it's like you're an, it's like an aged, painting sort of it's like color i don't know how you do it. you colorized it you know with some software but it looks like a painting no, check this out man well um, I, um my buddy damien hyde is a fantastic photographer damien he's, he's a he's a good good egg as we say and he's uh so damien was kind of keen to shoot the, to shoot the the, uh, the cover with film and literally one shot stuff no gimmicks no no post effects nothing and that was absolutely down my street as well. So we, we set up two spots. So we set like, um, I forget what the, the terminology for, for lighting, but we had like a peacock blue light and a pink, salmon pink from the other side. And uh, we was doing some kind of slow shutter speed stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got this, we got it all in one shot, man. Yeah, that front cover was, uh, we all saw it going, wow, I never saw that coming. Yeah, you oh, know? so that's, that's not colorized or anything. No. That's just from the light. Exactly, yeah, and, and holy the, 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 shit! So that, of course, the choice of film as well. Okay. Uh, so Damien was very specific about you know using some old um, expired film, things like that. So uh, which okay. obviously pr produces some kind of magic, you know. Obviously, you can, you know, you can go down the route of cross processing some some film as well and get some pretty wild results. But um, and then Damien got all the negatives, high high res scanned as well. So we got all the all the footage back all the prints and it was like man that's just phenomenal yeah and, that's amazing and this was this was at the very early stages of me recording the album new skin so so um it really informed the music which is that was the first time that happened actually suddenly seeing damien's front cover very early on oh okay gave me such a picture for the music because i could see what was working and what wasn't working um so yeah that was interesting it's a great process to try and get the visuals before you record any a note of music yeah that's it i i feel the same way as i love for specifically street photography and i always 
I like looking at street photography and I've thought of once in a while maybe submitting some of my shots because I, I like it and I, I think I have a good eye for it, but I never do because I don't know anything about post-processing and I don't want to learn about it. And I, you just can't compete yeah. with these, you know, this post-processing stuff looks really good, but I, but it looks post-processed. Yeah. It's uh, it's the same with music as well. It's like, you don't want to, you know, you know, if you're running logical pro tools, you know, you can have like 200 channels if you want to. <laughs> right. You no. Know? And, and, and you, the, the, the problem you don't, the problem that you have is just not committing something, you know, and, or printing, as we say, it's like, just commit that effect to that channel. You know, I mean, I've got like an old, um, turn of the seventies, Yuri 1176 in front of me, you know, that's going through a Neve into a Roger Mayer, uh, four, five, six. And that's the vocal channel. I use an, a great microphone as well, an old turn of the seventies, four and four. And it's like, man, that is the sound. You know, right. you don't need to do anything afterwards. Mm -hmm. Get it, get, you know, commit that sound, commit, commit that picture in that moment, you know, and just and get it exactly how you want it. Um, because you can, same as what we talked about earlier, you can overthink it or you can have all kinds of options to play around with afterwards. Totally. But you just don't commit that moment and you don't have anything to show for it apart from a fucking headache of confusion. and Yeah. And you haven't made a decision in the end. You think, oh, I'll put it in a folder, I'll come back to that one. <laughs> You, know, you think about uh, like photographers there when I discovered uh, like everyone discovered Vivian Mayer. Oh yeah, you know, love her stuff. Fantastic street photographer. Photographer. I mean, she took all in some all in New York, yeah, all man. in New York, all in the sixties. Uh, was it like a little roller flex? Yep. Looking down one. I mean, uh, yeah, she just had she just had a vision. You know, she could capture see a see a moment, and she, yeah, she seized the shot. You know, she really caught it. Yeah, she's she was great for that. So fleeting, and and that 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 certainly applies to music. And I've, you know, despite the way technology's gone, you know, when, when I talk about music and studios, my setup is very, very basic, you know, it really is. Because um, your voice is really good, and you can do that. <laughs> but if I go in there, I need all that other shit because I don't sing, you know. Well, so I mean, uh, it's it's yeah, I think. I, I love the, you know, I haven't gone the, the pure route yet of recording directly to tape. Hmm. I've only ever done that once with John Leckie, and that was that was pretty mind blowing, to watch John work. You know, uh, John Leckie being the producer of the Benz Radiohead, he was a T boy. I thought George uh, George Har George Harrison's All Things Must Pass. Really? That was what John's seen. He's like, man, this guy's seen the real shit. You know, happen. And you have to work the faders. You have to write it as a performance. That is really cool, man. So, like, you know, I got to see a bit of this, and it makes me think, well, at some point, I would like to just have a microphone going through a couple of nice things and then going straight to the tape. You know, you can put on Pink Moon, and you hear Nick's voice and that guitar really just leap out of the, out of the speakers because there's very... There's, well, it's, obviously, it's just Nick, but the... The technology as well that was there was probably the, some of the best that's never been beaten. You know, some of that, some of those microphones and preamps and desks in that in that era. You know, some of the greatest records were from that era as well because everything was just oh, this looks like, looks like a sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Everything was sounding great. And John Wood, the engineer of, of those Nick sessions, was a very great engineer that captured Nick's voice and guitar so well. Um, so those things rub off on me. You know. Uh, I can just hear the simplicity of things. Um, I'm still very guilty of, you know, thinking on Brian Wilson and thinking, well, I could put another harmony there. Uh, should, I'll do another one. No, that's that's a four. <laughs> but then I, but then I hear somebody like Jacob Collier, who's unbelievable. I mean, that guy's God knows how many vocals he's putting on tracks. So I don't feel bad about my own little three or four vocals. Oh, keep doing sense. what you're doing, man. What, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's working. But you know, it's certainly i've learned along the way about the process and you know how it's influenced the albums that i've made and i can really hear the the stepping stones of every record you know maybe i always feel spoilt from listening to that first album and my third album because i think john cotton the producer is one, one of the best out there he's got such a great ear for music and uh, a great ear for understanding the instrument and you know john will just sit there when i'm playing a guitar and just listen to it for quite a while. 
you know, and just finding the best beat. And he'll have an idea where, where that microphone's going to go. You know, we're going to hit the 12th fret there, pointing back on 45 degrees to the hand to capture a bit of, of a percussive thing, more the nails and the flesh going mm -hmm. on. Um, so I can hear that in, in the records. I can hear John's attention to detail, like changing the tones of microphones during the song. So we'd have like the verse sections of ribbon with, I don't know, maybe like a TLM 103, like a Neumann. And then suddenly the, the, the tones change because he changes microphone combinations into the chorus sections of songs. And it's John's the only person I've seen do that. So I got an appreciation from John about textural things and how mm. you can kind of push and pull those in the piece of music. Uh, it's very subtle, but I can listen to John's records and kind of with, with the headphones on just enjoy that kind of sonic world as well. I don't listen to my own music that much really once it's recorded, but certainly I can listen to John's records, albums one and three, and go, yeah, man, there's a... Uh, He's caught something there. I think he caught who I was, who I was then. And, um, yeah, I've kind of just taken that, taken that route of just un trying to understand what that instrument that needs. And, and, and of course, you know, the performance is king as well. I'd rather listen to a, a really rough Bob Dylan bootleg than a highly polished studio record. Yeah. You know, of anyone's. Give me the performance over the uh, the sonic candy. Any day. Yeah, yeah, the the authentic the authenticity of of it. Yeah. What, what? What? What kind of work did your parents do? Actually, I was curious about that. Um, well, my mother, she's um, she was a, a full time mother. You know, one of the hardest jobs in the world. Oh my God! Yeah, you kidding? It's um, and my dad was uh. My dad was all, all kinds of jobs from when I was a kid, all kinds. Uh, and he was also a drummer as well. Okay, so he got you in, because so, you said they went to concerts and stuff, so I figured they had some musical. Yeah, so they went to, they went to see Jimmy, you know, in 67 at the Gourmand mm -hmm. Theatre. Um, but they went together at the time, actually. I think it was that thing of like, ah, oh, Jimi Hendrix is in town. Who? Jimmy who? So then... Uh, so, but then my, you know, my record collection was my parents hmm. that I started listening to, and uh, but yeah, you know, from from those early days, my uh, they were they, ha they always have been very influential, you know, and they steered me onto a a real solid pathway of of music as well, and and a, you know, a, a, a grounding and understanding of you know great qualities in human beings and. Um, that kind of that that stood me in good stead for for growing up, certainly, um, and always encouraged music. You know, it was never, you know, there's never any never any pressure. But we, me, and my, me and my brother just naturally fell into it, and through our own intrigue, you know. And uh, but that was always very supportive. I mean, it wasn't a lot wasn't a lot of money around um, growing up, but they'd always ensure that we had something, an upgrade for the next birthday. My right. would get a new keyboard, you know, with some extra fancy sounds and and drum machines, and uh, and I'd get another guitar. And that's the, that's the uh, number one quality of successful. Number one thing that successful musicians have in common is they had support at home. Believe it or not, number yeah. one, yeah, by far. It's funny, isn't it? It's uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, we've got. I'm just looking back there. There's a there's two shoe boxes full of tapes, ninety minute tapes. Of me and my brother used to record. Uh, we had this whole kind of ghetto blaster thing, man. <laughs> ghetto <It's>, blaster. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, it was like we recorded it. It had a recording feature on there, so we used to record each other ourselves playing with our action figures and things. You know, we create like little radio shows and, um, and it was, um, you know, that was that was real, real, real kind of great times of just uh, those kind of days of innocence when it was only focused a bit just playing and just uh but also subconsciously as well just getting into a bit of recording and then you know my dad came home this one time with um like some eight track machine which i still got that's cool Am amstrad so we're talking mid 80s so my dad was always like it, 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 my parents were just always like 
seeing what we were into, and then they'd support it in some way. Right. You know, oh, Scott wants to play the drums now. Shit. Okay. <laughs> so there'd be a drum kit. And then, uh, but I always remember my, my dad was in a, a uh, like a cover, covers band, late 70s and early 80s, kind of playing locally. And so I'd always remember the drum kit in the house. You know, that was one of my earliest memories of seeing an instrument. And uh, Saturday morning, I'd see the drum kit in the in the living room, and I'd get out the kick drum and snare and just uh, wail the, the thing, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I look back very fondly on their belief in us. That's cool. You know, as kids and uh, and yeah, extremely supportive and uh, yeah, it's good times. You mentioned something a few minutes ago. You mentioned the sweet shop. I, we don't have those the same way you have them there. And I remember when I was over there and I went into one. What a cool place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sounds like ridiculous that I'm a 58-year-old guy, you know, Googling, uh, you know, uh, excited over a sweet shop. But I, I've never seen a place like that. It's so cool. Yeah, it's uh, a real old-fashioned candy store, you know. You've got the, you go in, there's the big jars. The jars, oh, yeah. We don't have yeah. that. The jars. Wow. Yeah. It's, that stuff's like, whew. yeah, it's the one way to kind of lose teeth. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just the joy, the, you know, the, the joy in that place, it was just phenomenal. You know, you don't go in there. You, how do you go in there and not be just like overwhelmed with happiness, you know, and feeling yeah. good, you know? It's pretty cool. Well, see, little... Yeah, that, that's it, man. It's, um, but yeah, those things just lure me in Yeah, every time. How can they not? Um, but yeah, certainly, uh, I suppose my sweet shops are more, guitar stores these days <laughs> I, follow, I follow a few guitar stores um, in your neck of the woods and um there's the great one actually i think it's on the west coast is it is it norm's yeah no i had norm on the show like three weeks ago no oh, yeah yeah he was great he was great yeah really good Man. guest yeah oh, royalty That's he was great. he was really good really interesting guy uh, he had a lot of uh, interesting things to say great so uh, where's his shop his shop is in outside of LA somewhere in LA you know LA is okay. just massive it's the biggest county in the country but it so it has like a lot of different towns I don't, Tarzana I don't I think maybe I don't know okay I don't I'm not familiar with California at all I'm, I'm an East Coast yeah, guy so, uh, when I Norm's, see that, Norm's rare oh, guitars every time I look on, on on their Instagram page I'm like yeah I see the back wall or when they're doing a talk or something I'll just see the back wall of a specific model of guitar I'm thinking Shit, man, there's like thirty of those. Yeah, it's it's ma it's massive. He's he's worked really really hard to to build yeah. that store up. I mean, he, oh, incredible. He, yeah, he 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 did he did the legwork early on. A lot of yeah, it. I can I get that sense. Yeah, and um, it would probably be a bad move for me to actually go there actually because uh, I'd have to sell the house. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll come back with a fifty four, you know, double oh seventeen. Yes, there you go. Get on. Oddly enough, in Tampa here where I live, which is not a big music town, it used to be a little bigger, but we have a store here called Replay, and they have like a million dollars worth of inventory. I don't know how, what the numbers are like or how they're supporting it, but maybe they're doing internet sales. I don't know, but they have a lot of vintage guitars in there sometimes. I don't know. Man, it's, you, you see this different places. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of, just on a digression, digression there, there's, the, the vintage market's kind of changed drastically in the last 15 years hmm. you know i remember uh, going down denmark street in 2006 it's my first real kind of london trek you know going into denmark street thinking shit i've just died and gone to heaven whoa <laughs> vintage and rare and his guitars whoa what's, what's going on so, so many guitar stores and then you go to you go to the same spot now in denmark street and there's like two two stores two three and it's just like so just pales in comparison to what it used to be you know it's really sparkly with like instruments in shop windows but now it's like so, so yeah it's, it's like almost for tourists now that want to come to denmark street and buy. it's yeah, it's, it's the same here it's, oh, it's we had this street in manhattan called 48th street it, the whole block was up and down lined with music store i mean every music store every inch there's wow. no there's no music stores there at all now there's a massive block in manhattan None. Well, my, my, um, it's bizarre, isn't it? I mean, my first trip to, to New York was in 2007. So after we'd finished um, Passing Strangers, put it by Island Records. And I was signed to Universal Republic. Uh, so I got uh, flown to, to New York. And I was very much aware of a couple of shops. And I went to Matt Umanov's. Right. There, he's gone. Oh. Matt's gone. Down in oh, the village. Are you serious? 
down Bleaker in the village. Street, yeah. yeah, Bleecker Street. One of my, used to be my favorite street in the city. It's like, oh, man. So I went there and phew, that was mind blowing. That's know? really cool store. I just, yeah, I went in there. You know, I had I got a bit of bit of bit of money, you know, to buy a guitar suddenly, and uh, I just wanted a, G, a Gibson J forty five. I said, "Dude, what's the cheapest one you got there?" And he pointed me to uh, like a red sunburst one from the sixty seven. Uh, picked it up, man. Jeez, this thing was like whew, sweet, sweet tone. I just bought it. It was like at the time, 2007, it was probably about two and a half dozen dollars. So it was a, it was a, it was a decent price, you know? Yeah, that's... Um, and I came home with it and I got the, still got the T-shirt and all that. So I've got the real fond, you know, memory of that time and, uh, yeah, hoping to go back, of course, at some point. Yeah. But then obviously found, yeah, I did find out that it's... Uh, I wasn't 100% sure if, if, if it had closed or not. Yeah, he's closed about four or five years ago. Man, that's no, so maybe sad. longer than that. Maybe like nine, eight or nine years ago at this point. Mm. Yeah, right yeah, there on Bleecker Street. Is uh, John's Pizza still there over the road? John's Pizza is still there, and he's got Fine they got pizzas. location on you know on Bleecker, but but there's a shop which was my favorite pizza shop called um, uh, right up the road on the other side of Bleecker. Uh, the next block was uh, Pizza Box, where they had an outdoor thing in the back. The only outdoor place that's gone too. I had been going there since I'm about 13, Man. and they closed. Yeah. It's um yeah, I went there twice in the same year. So on the second time, I was keen to just you know check a few places. My, it was my first real tour. So again, 2007. This was. Where'd you play? So we'd done. Um, we was like east to west in two weeks. So we we played in a place in New York. Is it Joe's Pub? Yeah, sure. Yeah, they're in still New around. York. So that was, uh, we played there. And then on, on, a, on a day off, we went to a little club. Is it Arlene's Grocery? Arlene's Grocery, yes. Yeah, where... I it's on the Lower East Side. That's it, yeah. Oh, I've got a bootleg of Jeff Buckley playing there. Yes. And uh, when I heard this, I was like, man, I've gotta, we've got to go there just to say. We've yeah, been, yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, so we've done those kind of pilgrimages as well. Went to Sunset Boulevard where Elliot Smith recorded Figure of Eight, Figure Eight album. The little the, the mural on the wall, the swirly pattern. So I pay my respects there to Elliot. Sure. And um, so yeah, these 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 places have you know. Well, next time you action. go to New York, make sure you hit me up. I'll give you a good itinerary. Sounds good, man. Sounds good. I'll tell you where I'm getting ready to go, and probably in June. So I'm looking forward. to nice. Haven't been there in a while. Nice. Tell me, uh, Scott, low points. Tell me some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with, and how'd you get through them. Um, that's a good question, really. I think, like we all do, you know, we'll suffer loss, I guess. And um, but I think, I, mean, I suppose, fortunately, it's not been, you know, mega heavy, you know, to this point. Touch wood. That's great. It's um, but yeah, I think you know, I think about the time of the second album. Some, we had some uh, lost, lost of some family members. So they may, may explain why the record is a bit more, um, yeah, kind of downbeat lyrically, perhaps. Um, but certainly, been pretty blessed to to have kept it a level. You know, um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, but um, yeah, I think it's uh, probably wise. I don't really. Uh, divulge too much <laughs> no fair enough man you know? well i'm glad that you said that overall it's been pretty good so i hope that continues for you yeah and I, 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 you know it goes that same but certainly the you know the the periods when it's you know getting pretty heavy it's uh you've there's always always been that that salvation in just you know picking up a piece of wood with six <laughs> strings on it you know, this kind of comfort blanket of just like releasing something through it, you know, and, and I guess without realizing that these, the feelings that have, that have kind of been brewing over the years or from record to record, they've just surfaced on them in the music. So you have to kind of dig, you know, a little kind of deeper, I suppose, for, you know, to find maybe clues, 
And I probably do myself as well, look back and think, why did I write that? Christ, yeah, that's that's probably what I was thinking. That's where I was. You know, it wasn't a good place. Um, but yeah, like, like I think for a lot of us, you know, and the, there's ill health going on or, you know, someone's not in great shape that's close to you as well. That's, uh, that's hard to deal with. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you know, but the try and try and remain. What was a practicing optimist? I like you know, that. Try, try and find a a channel just to just to really strive for something uh, purposeful and uh, puts me in a good place. Uh, it can be, yeah, it can be, it can be difficult. You know, but uh, you keep you keep coming back to music. You know, it's like this ever healing thing you know just just one thing you can come back to i can just go that pick this up instantly feel better you know instantly but then mood you know it's just, it just carries me as well all the time hey speaking of songwriting do you have a favorite song of all time uh no that you of your own oh okay ah Favorite song you wrote or a favorite song you like to play the most? Egotistical Alert. Um, no, that's not egotistical. I think um, there's certainly songs that I'm like really in a completist sense. You know, like I can I can look at the the words and I can hear the music and think that that the marriage of that of those two forms. Is really strong, almost like you know the, the cliche. It was, it was meant to be, you know. Um, so I, I like that that in in my songs where the 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 the, the imagery is really vivid, you know. Scene setters, scene setting songs, you know. The open lyric, you know, that just really takes you to a place. And I've I've done that on a few records where I've really felt. Uh, Give me one. Uh, Battle in a Lake of my third album. Um, that's, you know, the boat on the lake is always frozen in time. The wind, the winter descends as she can hear motorbikes. So it's like, I can't, again, baritone is probably a bit difficult to play it on, but it might be at this point where we might need to edit it. <laughs> Let me try and do it with an open G on a baritone. It's an open G. It would be in a different key, actually. Can't work it out. I'm just impressed how spot on your uh, hearing is. Because we're in logic here, so we can, we can. This is real time, so I can do this. <laughs> the winter descends, and she can hear the motorbikes. But every time the engine always dies, as the musical box is playing ballerina chimes. He has been gone seven years but still the bike remains under the frost of ballerina lake ballerina why do you dance so sad you're fulfilling the dream that he never got to see you Sleeps only with memories. They kiss her every night on her head like little notes of things he said to remind her he's alive and well inside her body. But what's a memory without a life? Doesn't fill her empty side.
Dude. Was like that? that was awesome. Thank you. Well, that was really cool. Uh, thank you. Is, is it our actual Ballerina Lake? Ballerina Lake, yeah. Yeah. Where is that? Oh, in my own head somewhere. Oh, Trail. okay. <laughs> it's a. Uh, but I was in, I was into uh, listening to a lot of Nick Cave at the time. I think. Dude, it's funny you mentioned. I'm 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 on a Nick Cave deep dive right now. Okay, yeah. From so, uh, from Peaky Blinders. There you go. Because because I was like, holy shit, he he must have made a fortune. Oh yeah. With yeah, some with, sync royalties there. On on oh my every, and and it's not just him. They have like two or three other bands within several of the episodes doing covers okay. of red right hand yeah, that's right yeah yeah so he's getting royal writing and publish you know assuming he owns sorted, that mate sorted yeah he's uh but i was i was listening to what's the album with um into my arms oh lord into my arms the boatman's call okay yeah, Nick Hay, the boatman's call fantastic album so I was listening to that a lot and also uh, reading a lot of Dylan Thomas. Okay. So I was really into the forms of words and rhythms of words and syllables and things and, and of course, creating pictures with words. And that's where Ballerina Lake came from. Okay. Just me really discovering a lot, much deeper sense of myself and trying to grasp words and pictures with a real striking sense, but also that complete juxtaposition of, you know, the ballet dancer, you know, she's dancing on the lake and her fellow was just like fucking crazy motorbike guy, you know? Right. Right. I thought, Whoa. Okay. How's that going to work? Well, of course, what's going to happen is he's going to go on his motorbike and then just kind of crash into the lake seven years ago. And still, the bike remains under the frost of Ballerina Lake. Yeah, that was cool. The whole the whole thing so, of that was great. It's it's I, I, I was I, I was interested in the challenge of just being, um, just putting two two characters in somewhere very um, surreal. Chalk and cheese, as you guys would say, right? Chalk and cheese, mate. Yeah, chalk and mm. cheese. So, yeah, that's uh, I'd say when it comes back to the question of. Uh, one of my favorite songs I think I've written, probably that's up there, certainly. Ballerina in the Lake. Ballerina in the Lake, yeah. Do you, a, lot of, a lot of stuff from that third record, actually. From the third record. Yeah. Well, that was You Were Liberated, too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Do you have any uh, Desert Island discs? I know Desert Island discs over there means singles, but over here it's like just favorite albums, top three favorite record album did i put anything on my notes give me let's have a look look at yeah. this question actually gonna get my uh proclaimers look working for you all guys good now. man all good i could walk 500 miles and so let's have a look um desert island discs whoa okay just for this moment because this is one of those things you know you could think about it later on it'd be three different records well 29 minutes of perfection pink moon nick drake i mean that's got to be up there um Man, you're putting Jeff Buckley's Grace in there as well, surely. <laughs> you know, uh, for me as well, Chris Cornell's Euphoria Morning album. Man. Great record, man. Yeah. I mean, anything Paul, uh, Simon and Garfunkel too, you can drop that in there, the early days stuff. Yeah. Um, Jones Just... Blue, it's going in, you know. Um, yeah. Hendrix, my first uh, experience with Jimmy was Electric Ladyland. And then Smash Hits. It's so funny. I think everyone owned Smash Hits. Yeah. It's so yeah. funny. I mean, you listen to, you know, Axis Boulder's Love. You can just, there's so much frightening invention for that time as well. It's, it's funny Funny you say that. I was out with my wife, and I think maybe our daughter was with us, who's older. She's 22, just turned 22. And an old Hendrix song came on. Uh, like a deep cut track yeah and i would we had a red light and i was just and i stopped and my wife said hey the light's green you gotta go and i said man i was just caught up in this song and i said just what you said i said this was such an amazing time 
you just listening to this on the radio 50, 55 years later. Yeah. But man, when this came out, it was like a spaceship. I'd love to have seen the panic. Yeah. All those guitarist eyes, you know, at that point. <laughs> you know, uh, Clapton, Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page. Yeah. All the, all the British blues guys, man, must have been shitting themselves, you know, because it's like. Didn't, Every didn't guitar Clapton, player, I think, was shitting themselves. Yeah, didn't Clapton say, like, he's like, is he really that good? Can't believe it. Yeah. You know, it's just. Just I mean, so, so inventive. The, um, yeah, and that, Jimmy as a producer, I mean, let's be honest, he was like 1966, he arrives in England, he was 24, 20, 23, 24. Mm -hmm. coming off the he only lived of, till 27, I think. In 27 club, yeah. So coming off the back of, you know, being too much for J little Richard, you know, and so you think, of a, as a, someone who's not in his mid-20s at this point, He's writing Axis Boulder's Love, you know, and he's he's reworking Bob Dylan's Along the Watchtower. Yeah. And you go, man. <laughs> Dropping the, 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 was he like playing a semitone down or a tone down or something? Uh, I think he was, uh, either one. I think it was a half, a t most guys play a half tone down. Yeah, because you, you hear the, you hear the riff on cross tone traffic. He's like, it's not even a bass, it's a guitar. It's like, man, he's playing so low as well on the Strat. But, but he was such a producer as well. He knew what he wanted to do. And the travesty of it all is obviously we lost him and such a young age. But also, you know, when Miles Davis talks about him playing Machine Gun, you know, and you... You know, the jazz world was suddenly acknowledging Jimmy as well of what he could do. The world was, could have opened up in such a big way for Jimmy that to think he was gone by 27 was, you know, yeah. devastating. Very, very tragic. Hmm. Just so a few is. more questions, Scott. Tough one. What do you like and dislike most about yourself? Um... Well, you know what? In all honesty, I was thinking about this question earlier, actually, because I was looking at your questions that you sent through, thinking, "Okay, yeah, that's a tricky one. What do I say there? I've no idea what to say there. So, what do I like and dislike about myself?" Um, I think when it comes to disliking, I think we can. I personally feel like I can improve in so many ways, just to be a better person, you know, and um, not to be so engrossed in my own thing you know um and to give a lot more to people you know it's um look out for others as m way more than I, that I that I have been um so just be more conscientious and just uh you know find a real strong air of empathy generally um then we get there's a danger of over all this time of uh, 15 years of making music that you just you kind of get a little bit of tunnel vision going on. You know, you've had the experiences that are elevating you beyond this place that you just didn't imagine. You know, the dream as a kid. You know, you sometimes just forget to, just to think of others. And, you know, we'll think, well, people need you at this moment in time. Put the guitar away, man. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's just a guitar. Um, so I just, just more of an more awareness of, uh, people that need me and just to you know snap out of something just focus on uh, what is important in that moment uh, sometimes sometimes lose a sense of perspective and that's maybe because over the years I've been so wrapped up in things you know and, and yeah music being a something that is obviously my, my livelihood but also it can also be detri detrimental in so many other ways well it's not just your vocation it's your like as you said it's your livelihood it's hard. i play guitar with a different uh, energy than you do yeah because i don't do it for a living yeah it's um yeah it's certainly and i think also as well the you know, events of the last two years it's really it certainly gives you a real dose of perspective even more so did, did anything good come out of the pandemic for you um, I made a record from 
a circumstance, you know, that was pretty much, you know, kind of put in front of me. Because new somebody, skin. Yeah, new skin. So which was, I couldn't work with anyone, you know. I could have re recorded remotely. Um, obviously, we all struggled in our own little ways, you know. I try to be proactive in that time and think, I had, I had an idea for an album. Uh, I was rehearsing at a church every week, just my own little space, just to kind of disconnect and, and just, you know, sing to the walls, you know, 500 year old walls. You know, I love your churches there, man. That's so, uh, so freaking cool. There's some pretty amazing buildings. Uh, we've got one locally to where I live and it's, uh, man, it sounds, sounds incredible in there. But, um, so new skin was born the record, which was all a lot more electronic based and, you know, me, me pretending to be Brian Eno. You know, and uh, so, yeah, as well as obviously from a music side, you know, really getting the sense of what it's all about, you know, on this trip, this this road trip in life. And um, yeah, it really is important to to stick together and uh, we, all, we all have our own battles that we probably don't talk about, you know, but everyone's suffering in their own little ways and I think it's really imperative that we just be aware of that and uh yeah look out for each other definitely it's thoughtful man what about like what do you like best about yourself mm, that's a difficult that's 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 uh that's, that's a heavy one i don't like much about myself in truth <laughs> um i'm i'm, I'm kind of i'm i'm maybe kind of proud of myself for from the point i've got to in my career and um and especially coming where i've come from as well you know it's like you know, the west midlands it's uh you know it's like i said we're kind of humble people you know and it's um there's certainly a lot of challenges that you face you know the stigma that's attached as well to the region maybe yeah i know even even i know that <laughs> yeah <laughs> even it's, i've heard so it's a, it's that, that in itself is like uh yeah like, oh we can i can do this man i can do this and of course you know when you think about the rock god himself robert plant who's from the same neck of the woods right you think well okay that guy played madison square garden a couple of nights was it was it a few nights on the trot maybe oh he's played in the garden a lot yeah so it's like yeah and he's you know you see robert and he's you wouldn't you know obviously yeah he's got a presence when he walks in it's just when I when I see Robert at the football matches, you know, we've got the, we support the same football team. I'm sure, he's just a regular guy, no? He is, man. He yeah. is. And we, we went to his uh, his 60th birthday in a uh, in the Queen's Head in Wolverley, which is like a little pub. Man, it was 60. That experience. must have been a. I mean, nothing. I don't mean to be funny. That must have been a while ago, no? He's uh, 72 now. Yeah, I figured he's in his early 70s. Yeah. Lenny Kravitz was there as well. It was like, man, this is so surreal. What's going on? <laughs> so, um, but I think answer to the question it's i think there's a there's a part of me which really feels you know like give myself a little pat on the back and think well no man you've you had the dream to make a career in music uh, or the comic book artist which never happened but uh to be a musician in today's climate as well and to and to be on to thinking about my my eighth record you know that that um I never kind of imagined that really. Yeah, you know, to make one record was was, was pretty astounding. Um, but to get to the experiences that I've had as well, uh, just made me feel like I've done something right. You know, Good. really, really stuck to my guns and and believed in 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 the pathway that I've taken. You know, artistically, maybe a little bit questionable here and there, but I've certainly had the belief in the noise that I make. Good. You know, and. Uh, and I'm excited for the next phase as well. Um, but yeah, still working on the likes, you know. It's uh, although it's a click-based one these days, isn't it? You know, I think. <laughs> I um, hate that. Yeah, it's. I've got a lot of lot of things I need to work on. I think certainly. we all don't, don't we all, man? Yeah. It's funny that I often, once in a while, I ask myself these questions, and how I, I would also. I would like to be more empathetic as well. Hmm. And I noticed though, the less I, 
I, I kind of said something about the, the more empathetic I am to myself, which is very hard for me to do because I always balance empathy between feeling sorry and I'm not a guy to feel sorry for myself. And I don't have much to feel sorry about, but I'm just saying, you know, I, I, I don't want to do that. But I, I know that the more I tolerance I give myself, the easier I could be tolerant with others. Yeah. It's interesting that you said that. Yeah. You have any hobbies outside of music? Hmm. Uh, well, my little, my little boy's four now, so it's... Um... That's your new hobby. Man, yeah, my <laughs> hobby. Um, so yeah, playing with Elliot, you know, all kinds of games, trains, monster trucks. You know, every day is a surprise. He's into one thing, one day, and the next day something different. So uh, it's it's a, it's an it's an adventure. Uh, that so, must be a challenge during COVID, having a young child at home. Yeah, well, again, all brand. A brand new experience being a parent, you know, he's only four, so right. He spent half his life, you know, with COVID, you know, the whole COVID thing. But, um, so the, yeah, it's, it's presenting challenges, um, as well as me trying to learn how to be a dad. You know, that's, that's tough. Uh, you always, you'll be learning yeah. for twenty years. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not uh, being funny. I'm not not you. I mean, we all. I I certainly yeah. did. I still learn. My oldest son's thirty two. I'm yeah. still learning. That's it. Yes. Um, yeah. It feels. Uh, I'm, yeah, man. I'm always giving myself grief at the end of the day, thinking, "Why did I do that? Why did I say that?" Yeah, you that's know? a tough one. It's. Uh, but you know, the next day, you, you, you're like anything. You try and take that experience from the previous day, and, and you, you you take the good stuff from it. If there was anything in there, and you put it into your your new self for the following day. Let's learn from you. Just that you're thinking about it, you're going to do a good job, man. It's yeah. the guys that aren't thinking about that. I think that those, their kids need to worry. Yeah. Yeah, but it's uh, man, it's, it's an adventure, certainly. Um, I know, strange little things as well. I mean, because of uh, Elliot's uh, kind of what he's into, it's making me recollect my childhood as well. As oh, okay. So obviously I'm an 80s kid, you know, so... I've got this massive obsession at the moment with, with old action figures. And so it's, uh, and me and Elliot talk about, oh, we haven't got that, that He-Man figure. Okay, should we find him somewhere? Okay, yeah, let's <laughs> find him. eBay. eBay, yeah. Let's find Hordak. That's Where is so he? funny. Oh, there's, there's one on there, Elliot. Look, he's got broken legs. Doesn't matter, Dad, we can fix them. Yes. Awesome. We'll take him to the He-Man hospital. <laughs> yeah, so that's where I'm at the mo at the moment. Fixing broken toys and repairing old toys, which is kind of fun. Yeah, it is fun. Could be a lot worse. And um, and also getting toys that I kind of had as a kid, but then sold on or moved on when I was, you know, like uh, as you guys call them, the garage sales or car boot sales for us. Mm -hmm. I, I'd sell some of my toys when I was younger. You know, my brother sold the Millennium Falcon. What? You know, it's like discovering all these old toys again has been really, really great because it reminds me of my childhood and. And, you know, you've you have ways that you were uh that you thought was the the way. Uh like if I was with Elliot doing something, I think, well what would my parents have done in that moment? So I try to try to channel some of that really. Some of their ethos is. But uh yeah. That's toys. cool. And last question, man, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last ten years? And, and for you, let's call it six or seven years. And, and, and has that been intentional or just a natural part of aging? Uh, I'd say parents, is, again, being a parent, that's the biggest change. Yeah. Well, that question, that's, um, yeah, kind of almost like press, press the reset button, you know. It's, uh, you feel like you kind of knew what you were doing. And then until you have a baby, it's like... Shit, man, I don't know anything. <laughs> okay, he's just puked everywhere. What do I do? Okay, what do I look for? Wet wipes. Okay. And just try to, yeah, just trying to get a grasp on that. You know, that's a big change. Um, and also trying to, trying to incorporate that change into, you know, me, which has been a musician for, since I was 11, and has always gone to pick up a guitar. You know, in that moment of 
salvation and the need to, you know, just to comfort myself some way, you know, and sometimes you haven't been able to do that. That was quite difficult as well. Yeah, okay. It's like, oh, I suddenly can't reach for the guitar. Suddenly there's not a guitar in the house. Okay, what do I do? Suddenly kind of, almost like the fingers are getting like this nervous energy because I didn't know where to go. Um, so trying to integrate being a, a, a working musician is quite challenging as a parent as well. Um, you know, I think it's interesting, like touring is the only real way you get to rehearse these days for me. Yeah. You know, I learn, you can probably see quite a difference from my first show of the tour to the very end of the tour. I'm so kind of rusty, you know, I don't sing at home. Well, everybody's, especially after coming off of COVID, I mean, I, I'd have guys talking to me over the last, you know, year and like, oh my God, I haven't practiced in two years. Yeah. Well, my band, I haven't seen my band member. Was, I, I, I've known these guys 20 years and we haven't seen him in a year and a half and it feels really weird, stuff like that. Yeah, big time. I mean, man, it was it was pretty much rabbit in the, rabbit in the headlights. You know, we, so from the back end of, of COVID and like middle of like last August, last year, you know, in, the, in, in England, venues and theatres were, you know, tentatively opening up again and, you know, I'm getting invited to do a tour with Robert Plant. And, you know, we're playing to like a thousand capacity theatres all of a sudden from nothing for like 18 months. Right. So I was like, this is, man, this is crazy. Suddenly getting this experience again with these, in this kind of almost very surreal moment, you know, and uh, and feeling rusty as well. Yeah, certainly feeling like I hadn't kind of practised in a long while. Um, but yeah, totally worth it when the curtains go up and you see the audience and you just make some noise again. It's uh, yeah, liberating. Right on. I'm glad you're back out on the road. Hey, listen, I want to, I'm sorry. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Great place. I want to thank you very much for taking all the time. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for being so cool to hang out with. And let me tell Cheers, people man. where to find you. Uh, I would really encourage everybody to check out Scott, Scott's music. I really, I dug into his entire catalog. He's got great songs. He's, his voice is is, is beautiful. It, it's very moving, and his music is great. You can find him online at Scott Matthews. It's two T's dot UK, not dot co UK, just Scott Matthews dot UK. And one. you can, if you're going to buy records, buy them from there as well. That that would be the best thing to do. He is. How long is your tour with Plant? Uh, yeah. So we're uh, so I'll be in Ireland this week. Um, so starting on the 23rd or 24th of March, I believe. Um, and then we're uh, pretty much all through April with Robert and his band Saving Grace. Um, so who's, his, the, who's his guitar player now? So he's got, um, so he's all uh, local uh, musicians. Okay. Uh, so he's got a really interesting lineup, actually. He's got Susie Diane, who's a local singer. She's great. And her husband, uh, Ollie Jefferson on drums. Man, he's so good. Uh, on guitar, they've got uh, Matt Worley really really interesting so they've got no bass player so it's matt Worley on guitar a uh, quattro guitar okay um, mandolins all kinds of exotic stuff instrumentally right. uh, amazing and they've got tony kelsey who also plays sometimes they'll have songs where they both play baritone electrics like dan electros or um so it's a real texturally really interesting band that tells uh, you a lot about Plant, too, that oh, he's, man. like, got some local guys. I mean, this guy can call up any human being in the world yeah. and pay them exactly. nothing if he wanted yeah. to, and they'd all be like, oh, let me, come. you know, yes. Yeah, exactly. It, it um, shows you what a what a laid-back guy he is. Exactly. It says a lot, yeah. Um, the, fir the first sound check on the, the last tour was like, I was like, okay, I can't hear any bass guitar. Which kind of explains why the bass drum is massive in the band. It's like you hear that old jazz drum, kick drum, and it's man, it's the most incredible sound. But it, it's it's the fundamental of the of the of the song. And then when Tony and, and Matt come in on the guitars, you hear like a, this textural wall of whoa, what's going on there, man? Tony's playing with some delay with a baritone, which carries the the low weight in another register and. Then Matt's playing like a a twelve string with a capo right up on the seventh fret. You're like, whoa, man, that's just genius. 
and then Susie and Robert start to sing together and their voices work so so lovely uh, and Robert's singing's changed as well you know he's, he's discovering a, a much lower register in his voice uh, not quite the depths of Johnny Cash but certainly there's a different tone to his voice now that's kind of what, almost what, what Roy Harper was saying you know about yeah you know he's obviously at the time when I met him he was like in his mid-60s so Roy has had the experience of having a quite a range of vocal back in the day but then suddenly oh I've lost it whoa what's going down you know tuned down yeah so Robert's certainly you know there's moments when Robert though really lets rip you know suddenly you can tell the audience waiting for a Zeppelin number but yeah I was gonna ask do you something. does he do any Zeppelin or or no, old no. Robert Plant stuff no he should though man he should drop a few in there yeah one or two even like solo stuff you know well, I've uh, seen him. With, I've seen. I've seen him do it with the Alison Krauss and T Bone Burnett, you know, and it's just like the audience. It lo it just elevates, uh, but Robert sometimes on this tour with Saving Grace, he'll do a vocal part that's just like the audience have been waiting for. You know, you can just feel it, and the room, man, when Robert's voice really goes for it in the room, you're kind of reminded of like, yeah, he's, he's, he's still the man, isn't he? Yeah. You know? no questions um yeah phenomenal range and and again when he was like 20 early 20s doing this stuff it's uh frightening yeah you know? some but, people uh, have that what an experience yeah Feel well, i'm really blessed. glad you get to enjoy that and participate in that yeah any plans on coming to america mate i'd love to uh the the, the, the last tour was back in 2007 so a lot of catching up to do you know, I've got a lot of friends over your way as well, so it'd be nice to touch base with, with those and uh, and to tour again. You know, and yeah, to, to tour the US would be lovely. Um, so I'm hoping it will happen. Good, you know, I hope so too. Uh, definitely sooner rather than later. Great. Yeah. Listen, thank you for everything. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, the new record? Say, I mean, we talked about the cover, but is there anything in, in that it's more electronic? Do you want to mention anything about it? Uh, so, well, interestingly. I'm actually, well, this is the first time I've ever done this. Right as we speak, I'm recording New Skin, the acoustic version. So during COVID, I was working on my own. Made more of an electronic album, um, which was a real departure for me. Yeah. Um, but So I'm, just out of pure curiosity, I've gone back to um, trying to record the New Skin songs in an acoustic form. I so think like, that instance, is so cool. Yeah, well, it's like... So one of the tracks is um, is on a baritone, um, Gretsch baritone. So a big electric guitar sound, you know, but I've managed to convert it to a to an acoustic. And I think it's, so to give an example of just the verse, it's like. So, so the challenge of the record is to, it's, it'll, it'll be the most, pared down record I've ever made so it's just guitar and voice essentially um, so I found that the discipline that's needed is is, is, is is difficult for someone like me who likes to put harmonies everywhere um, so I've tried to do a simpler version so I'm kind of one of the guitar parts is like a Dude, a whole new challenge that was awesome that's <laughs> so cool i gotta tell everybody 
he's finger picking everything. I mean, you're a proper, like a legit guitar player, man. I mean, seriously. Oh, thanks. Yeah. No, I mean, you're, you're, cause you're not just playing notes. You're, first of all, you're using, you're not using a pick. You're just using your, your finger styling and you're, you're changing the volume of different individual strings and your, you know, your attack. That's a lot going on there. Yeah. It's, uh, I think the guitarist in me that's always been there as, yeah. uh, as, and I, I haven't got many guitars, you know, in terms of the collection, there's probably about 10 or something, which is pretty modest. Um, but I'm always looking for ways to, to, to marry the, the, the guitar sound with my voice, where my voice is going. You do a great job of that, man, actually. Oh, jeez. It's, um, really it's good. Just, uh, I think having something like the baritone has really opened up different registers. You know, because suddenly we, the tuning's B to B. So like, but then if you go in, you know, suddenly without the capo, we're now in a drop A, so a double drop A. So you've got suddenly the range is pretty. It's, you can go anywhere, you know. tuned before I went on air really your voice what I'm amazed at is when you start singing man your voice is like spot on and I mean I know for you you're a singer so it's and you're a good singer so it's normal but for someone who has no singing ability at all I'm like <laughs> it's just amazing like it's boom it's it's right where it needs to be man it's pretty pretty impressive you got oh, a gift there man. A, that's very interesting to hear actually because uh constantly um every record i've ever made i enjoy the process until i start singing because i'm like oh this is the time when we're going to spoil the song now okay <laughs> no not at all it's, I would say, uh, yeah. no. I, like yeah I've, I've plenty of plenty of battles with the just the idea of singing you know as i said earlier i think it's uh i still find it quite a daunting prospect um the only time i've uh, i put it my my, my um fourth album home part one and there's a piano song on there two piano songs no one 86 floors from heaven it's called and suddenly we play the song live i'm like well i've really got no piano i, I recorded piano on the album but i've got no piano skills really painful to watch so i thought okay i'm not going to play piano so i'll get danny Keane on the piano danny's herbie hancock the second you know just get him on play piano so i'm there hands free with the microphone on the stage first time playing this song and really panic stricken with like okay i even said to danny backstage look what do i do with my hands during the singing bit danny's like don't worry about it don't put your hands in your pockets you know whatever you want to do so i'm just there on the stage just singing away for the first time ever with a um a guitar which was very very peculiar feeling because i just i probably looked uncomfortable as well um and it was like okay i'm presenting myself as just a singer now and that idea still still gives me gives me a nightmares so i'll give you your own advice you're overthinking it <laughs> yeah <laughs> just just sing man you're a great singer just go fucking sing oh, you're an geez, excellent dude. singer and guess what somebody might not like it that's okay yeah of course <laughs> right they'll turn the channel or whatever yeah somebody hey. came, somebody came to my gig once and said um, they were sitting in the front row in cardiff and in uh, wales yeah she's yeah. like she's like i can't do the accent but it's like why do you always sing sad songs like she was really down about me just singing these sad songs and I just like, I didn't know what to say in that moment. I just said, well, um, should we play some Beyonce then? <laughs> That's my thing, man. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Would you ask Keith Richards why he plays a, a, an amplifier? You know, why don't you yeah, just so I, you tone know, down and play an acoustic, Keith? You know? Exactly, yeah. So I just, <laughs> well, that's the way it is. Like you know, it or lump it. Can't make everybody happy, right, Scott? Exactly. Hey, listen, thank you very much for everything. Um, yeah, cheers, Greg. Thanks for, for your time, man. Thank you. Really appreciate your time. Hang on, we'll wrap up and we say goodbye to everybody. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Again, please check out Scott Matthews. It's Scott with two Ts, Matthews.uk. 
Uh, if you only have time to listen to one album, I would suggest you, my favorite record was Home Part 2. I mean, they're all great, but if you only have time for this to start there, it'll be, you, you, you can do yourself no wrong. Uh, thanks very much to Scott Matthews for spending time with us. If, if you're in the UK, come check him out on tour or in Ireland. And uh, most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar or whatever you do, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Scott, thanks for everything, man. Hey, thanks, Craig. Take care.